everyone! In this video, I'd like to take a look at the reaction mechanism for hydroboration oxidation. This is a mechanism that I know sometimes people gloss over or call it a black box because the arrows can be a little bit uh, tedious in terms of them being a lot of them, but it's not a black box in terms of it's not magic. We do know how this reaction actually happens, so I want to talk through that. Before I do, there's just one thing I want to mention. In this particular reaction, we're going to look at the reaction of an alkene and BH3. And we're going to treat BH3 like it's an isolated molecule. The reality is it's not going to be isolated. It's not a particularly stable molecule because the boron only has three bonds. So it has less than the octet. So if we were to find this in nature, it would actually be a gas and it would be found as a dimer, meaning two BH3s would be linked to one another. So in order for this reaction to be able to happen and not be a rather uh, dangerous event, we're going to have the BH3 put into THF. So what happens is THF is this molecule right here, and you can see that that oxygen has two electrons. So it has electrons that it's able to share with the BH3 in order to stabilize it so that our reaction can happen. So technically that boron does have a ligand attached to it. When I do this mechanism, I'm going to show it without that uh, particular ligand, but just know sometimes you will see versions where it is attached. So let's take a look at it. Okay, so let's take a look here. So over here we have our alkene, and here we have our BH3. So remember, alkenes are electron rich, so they behave as nucleophiles. We know that this boron here is going to be electron deficient, so that would be a good attack point for this to come and hit that boron. So what's going to happen is our pi electrons are going to break, and they're going to swing up, and they're going to attack that boron. Now remember, when this is happening, the reason I'm drawing the arrow from this carbon rather than that carbon is very purposeful. So what we're saying here is that when those electrons are actually swinging up to the boron, one of these two carbons is going to have to be willing to release those electrons, and it's going to start to develop a positive charge. So if you look here, your options are either a primary carbon that has a positive charge, partial positive, or we have this carbon here which has one, two, three, so up to three carbons attached to it. We know that when we're talking about carbons getting positive, that they're stabilized by the hyperconjugation of the other carbons that are adjacent to it. What that boils down to is that if I had to pick which carbon to have the positive charge, I would pick this one because it is more stabilized. So that means that the electrons are going to come, that primary carbon will attach to the boron, and then this here will behave like a nucleophile hydride, and it'll take those electrons here, and it's going to attack that carbon that was developing the positive charge. So that's why we have to have the boron add on one position, and the hydride will attach on the other position. Another important point to realize is that because this here is a concerted reaction, meaning that all of these steps are happening in one step of this me mechanism that we have, we know that these are going to add to the same side. So this would be a syn addition. So when this happens then, that means that this hydrogen that was attached to the boron has now switched to this carbon position here, and that this bor boron here is now attached to that primary carbon. So this here that we have is the same position that we have right over here. So now, this boron here has two other hydrogens attached. It's not very sterically hindered. So those hydrogens are accessible. And what we'll find is exactly the same steps are going to happen again. So here, our primary carbon in this alkene attacks the boron. This hydrogen here attacks like a hydride over here to this position. And so now our boron has one H attached and then two of those groups. Because we have a hydrogen, this can happen yet one more time. And so this is our final product, where every single hydrogen has now been replaced with that original group that we started out with. So now one thing to keep in mind, if the boron started to have bulkier groups around it, it would start to inhibit this reaction happening again because there'd be too much steric hindrance. In a case where maybe you only want to have this reaction happen once, you might use something like 9BBN. So 9BBN here is a boron that has two R groups and one H attached to it. So that would mean this cycle would happen once. And over here, because it's only got one hydrogen on it, we're able to prevent any other additions happening because also it's a very big bulky group. So now this is our hydroboration. Let's take a look at the oxidation. 
Okay, so now let's take a look at the oxidation portion. So remember, what we just saw in the hydroboration oxidation was step one, hydroboration, where the boron is going to add on to the alkene. In the oxidation step, that boron is now going to get replaced with an alcohol or an OH group. So just one point about this, I've seen it written in two ways. When people write the reactants needed for the second step, I've seen it written as water, hydrogen peroxide, and potassium hydroxide. I've also seen it written just potassium hydroxide and hydrogen peroxide. I don't really think that there should be a big difference on which one you pick. I always suggest follow what your prof prefers. So over here, what you'll see is we have the product from our previous step. And now I'm going to react with this, which is essentially hydrogen peroxide with an H removed. And this was formed by the reaction of our strong base and the hydrogen peroxide. This here makes that oxygen a really great nucleophile, and it's able to come and attack that boron position, which we've said as before, it's going to be electron deficient, so that's why it's a good attack point. Now, when we move over into this area here, we notice that that boron has a formal charge of negative 1 on it, which is not that favorable. And because of that, it's going to precipitate a 1-2 alkyl shift, where the alkyl group here, it doesn't matter which one, I'm just going to start with this one, is going to shift from the position on the boron over to this oxygen position. Now, when that happens, right, our oxygen is going to then lose this OH group, it's going to get kicked off which means that the product we're forming here is this one. So two of those alkyl groups have not changed, but you can see here that third alkyl group has now shifted onto that O that came here from the hydrogen peroxide that we had up here. So now we're gonna move on to the next step to see how this then becomes an alcohol. Okay, so we're not actually done with the oxidation step. We have a little bit more to do. I just ran out of space. So let's take it up from where we left off. So over here, this is the product that we had. So you can see that we've got the boron, we have the two alkyl groups attached to it, and then we also have that oxygen that came from the peroxide and the alkyl group that shifted onto that oxygen. So now remember, what we did previously was we kicked off this hydroxide from the peroxide group when this group shifted onto the oxygen. So that means we now have a really good nucleophile in solution that can come and attack that boron. And that's what's going to happen. We can see now that our boron has the two groups here, it has this oxygen group here, and then it has the hydroxide. The problem again, though, is that our boron now has a negative charge on it. So what's going to happen is that this group is going to be kicked off in order to normalize and get back to that formal charge of zero on the boron. And we've now kicked off this group. So now if we were to go and protonate it by adding acid to the solution, we would see here is our H, and we now have the alcohol that we were hoping to make in this reaction. So that's actually how the reaction happens. It is important to keep in mind that there are still two other alkyl groups that we have attached to that boron. So this step here is going to happen three times. First one kicks off the first group, then we'd want to do the same thing, kick off the second, and the third time, kick it off. So let's take a final wrap up and see what we actually form. Okay, so let's do a recap then of everything that we've looked at and kind of summarize what that whole re reaction mechanism does and kind of remind ourselves what we were doing. So what we're doing when we are dealing with the hydroboration, oxidation, is we're going to take an alkene and we're going to make an alcohol where the alcohol group is placed on the less substituted position. Now remember, that is explained by the transition state because of where the partial positive transition carbocation happens. And it can also be explained by the steric hindrance. So it's easier for a bulkier group to come and attack a primary position than, say, this tertiary position over here. We also know that we're going to have this replacement in the case of BH3 happen three times because each of the hydrogens gets replaced, which is why we have three equivalents of product made for every one of those. If we were dealing with something like 9BBN instead, which only has one hydrogen and it's a very big bulky group, we would up the amount of this particular major product we made, and we would also only make one equivalent because there's only one hydrogen to be replaced on that boron. Once we've made that group, we then follow this up with step two, where we're going to react hydrogen peroxide and our strong base. Remember, sometimes water will be included, sometimes it won't. That won't really make or break what you're doing. So now in this oxidation step, essentially what happens is that we are going to now replace the boron position with OH uh, with an acid workup to make sure that we get this protonated at the end. And that's pretty much what's happening in hydroboration oxidation.